have put us into a place where if you mm. speak out, you will be punished. They even said that in the film and the Leah Thomas mm. uh, teammates that spoke out said, if we said anything publicly, we were going to be attacked. They will be able to look up your name forever and forever. You will be known as transphobic. And that is the scariest thing to this generation of kids coming into adulthood right now is to be labeled as transphobic. They, they can't reckon this worldview that we all know with what they're, what they're being told by their peers right now. They, they are more scared of upsetting the people that are there in the classroom sitting next to them than to look at worldly views and truth and, and seek that at this point in time. If we're really being honest, June is all year round because the stuff that we see in June, the queer beer and the events for the LGBT and, and the rainbow colored flags all over social media, we see those things all year round. They, they are the most favored sort of protected minority class. Black folk, once again, are at the back of the bus looking to, to see whatever, what's the, you know, what's, what's going on in the front. And, and I would make that argument easily that the fact that, that, that the rainbow flag flies from embassies uh, across, this na across the world at any different given time of year, um, I, I, I think I would say that, yeah, America has been thoroughly queered and it's just a matter of who's willing to step up to, to fight back against that. I guarantee you, Christian, he's young, uh, one of our producers, but at some point he's going to have a bad experience with police because mm -hmm. police are kind of jerks and they got tough jobs and blah, blah, blah. But no one expects me and Christian to connect over, oh, we both had bad experience with police. But mm -hmm. black people, that's our connection. Oh, yeah. my God, a white person said something rude to me that I experienced some sort of microaggression. That's our, again, our connection isn't based on us, it's based on white people. White people are what tie us together. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I just don't like for people to make me feel like I have to connect with them based on anything they say, whether it's race or uh, because I'm a woman. I remember when people didn't vote for Hillary and Michelle Obama told us as black women, like we really need to take a second look at ourselves if we didn't vote for her as women. I don't have to agree with someone just on surface things that we may have in common. I don't like that. I'm starting to wish the NBA stood for <clears throat> no bitch assness because <laughs> oh, oh, it oh. appears that they are just a bunch of puppets and they have, the Democrats have their hand up there behind and just animating them. Whenever they have something that they want to do, that's when the NBA stands up and it really irritates me like you said because these are black athletes you know what is happening in inner cities in the black communities i've never seen them speak out mostly on any topic until the media says this is the topic of the time this is when you say something now that the democrats are on this big gun grab now we want to talk about gun violence. When we've had people dying in our communities for, for years and they haven't pushed this. And so that really irritates me and I'm sick of them just being puppets for the Democrat party. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Capehart would not piss on a heterosexual black man set ablaze at the White House. He loves fruit and he hates the way God made him. For stating this obvious truth, I'll be accused of homophobia and transphobia. It's not true. I despise dishonesty and lies. I'm tired of black elites disconnected from the reality of working class people standing on the caskets of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Philando Castile, Breonna Taylor, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, and Michael Brown to advance the plight of the alphabet mafia. Capehart is using black people to promote an agenda that directly contradicts the gospel spelled out in the Bible. I'm afraid of Jonathan Capehart. He's a recruiter for what I like to call Broke Backs Mountain. You know, the, the rainbow is a sign, a sign of God's covenant, his promise 
with mankind. It's a it's sign. It's actually a sign of his mercy and grace. I, it's all, I mean, uh, that's all of that's in that. Like, I destroyed the world and I left a remnant and, and, and this and is my promise. I'm never going to destroy it this way again. Right, right. This, this is my promise. And so whenever I refer to that in my preaching and teaching, how I link this back to God is he gives us a sign that says, I'm still keeping my end of the bargain on this. Every time we see a rainbow, God is saying, remember what the promise I made? Remember the promise I made? But the enemy is all about perversion and destruction, Jason. So he will take a sign of warning, a sign of mercy, a sign of grace, and pervert that to a sign of, hey, I'm living in my rebellion and I'm proud of it. If Jalen Brown or anybody else would actually go to Philadelphia, Chicago, the Washington, Baltimore area, D.C., Baltimore, New Orleans, L.A., and then say, hey, hey, guys, I want to address something here before tonight's game. I am not playing because of the gun violence in these cities that have NBA franchises, and I believe that we have to eradicate all of this stuff one city at a time, one mind at a time. So tonight's game is not important. If they would actually do that, then I'd say, you know what, I, I think that's more of a noble gesture. But just talking about it, using the phrase, raising awareness, hashtagging on Twitter and wearing a T-shirt, it is basically modern activism, which is a bunch of hollow gestures. Uh, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think people are going to move on from this. I think people are fed up and uh, they want to return to some semblance of sanity in our culture. And so the critics and everybody else, they can they can try to remain silent as long as they can. But I, I don't think it's going to hold. I think eventually they're going to have to come up with some kind of response to this. I don't know the answer to this question, so I probably shouldn't ask it, or I don't even know. But you came with a gentleman, and I'm wondering, is that a driver or is that security? Is your life moved to a point where you need security when you're out in public? Yeah, we have security right now um, because of the threats. You know, that's, and the thing is, we know that most of the people that make threats, they're just keyboard warriors. But um, also, we're, you know, there, there are a lot of really deranged people out there. And so you have to take, we're going to take every threat seriously. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to go to the police. I mean, to make an explicit threat against somebody, as in, I'm going to kill you, is a crime. And we're going to go after you for that. It's just simple as that. If you want to be cool, if you want to fit in, if you want to get away, if you want to be oppressed and one of the cool kids, this LGBT thing is the way to go. That pressure is real, and that's why I think all parents need to be right there with you and sending money and guns and whatever else they need to Matt Walsh. Um, yeah, I think uh, there's the, the peer pressure aspect of it, like we talked about. The contagion, you guys talked yeah, about it. the social it. contagion yeah. aspect of it cannot be understated. The fact that there's, as you say, there's a social capital in being in the LGBT club. To, and, and that's one thing I learned film. There are a lot of things that I, I thought I knew most of what there was to know about this issue before we filmed the documentary. I learned a lot through the process and um, just to the extent to which there is this social capital in being LGBT. Um, it's just, the, it's the coolest thing, right? So f the reason we didn't throw God into it, um, and I, I don't even like to put it that way, but the reason yeah. why we didn't explicitly say something about God at the very end, my wife could have said, she could have quoted Genesis. She could have uh, said, uh, you know, an adult human female who's created by God or something like that, right? And the reason we didn't do that is because to, we didn't think, number one, to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish, that it was, it was necessary. And what I didn't want was to give the left an escape hatch at the very end. I think that they would have really loved it if we had done that because, and in fact, I think that if at the very end we had ended on a sermon, we had ended with a Bible quote, or if instead of going to my wife, I had gone to a, a, a clergyman to, for the answer and he had told me something spiritual. I think if I had done that, then we'd be getting all kinds of reviews from mainstream critics so that they could glom onto that point and say that, oh, you see this, this is all just, this is all just Bible thumping. And in order to, to, be, to be a critic of uh, this gender ideology, you have, to be, you, know, you have to be a Christian. He made my point. How so? You just said if we had done that, we would have gotten all these mainstream reviews and in marketing and publicity, all publicity is good publicity. And so if anybody that would have watched the first 88 minutes and then the last two minutes uh, set the critics off and whatever, but if you make it through that first 88 minutes, 
they've been so devastated by their own idiocy that anything that would have gotten it more attention, anything that would have provoked the left even more, made it so they couldn't sit around ah! <laughs> and made them have to engage with it, I think would have been better.